Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, we're happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 77 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson. For the next mm, half hour, I'm gonna be ranting at you about things that you really ought to know about and pay attention to. Uh, any responses can be sent to me directly. They should be, in fact, at hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Um, Please, uh, if you do send me an email, please mention something like um, left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that so I know it's not spam. Also, uh, you can check out my website, which will be up here a couple of times during the show. Uh, and if you didn't catch the email, you can get the, website, uh, the, uh, the email at the website. Okay, with that uh, quick introduction to the show, um, this is for the week of October 11th to 17th, 2012. And we're going to start out with a couple of stories about living under the anti-terrorism regime in the United States. First, I'm going to start out by stipulating a few facts in this first story. You know, stipulate is, you know, where you say, you state a couple of facts that everybody agrees are true. Uh, the first fact is Abdullah al-Kid is an American citizen. He was born and raised in the United States. In March 2003, he was at Dulles Airport outside Washington, D.C., he, he was going to fly to Saudi Arabia to uh, work on his doctorate in Islamic studies. He was arrested at the airport. He was taken out in handcuffs. He was imprisoned for 16 days, during which he was repeatedly strip searched and often left naked in his cell. The argument for arresting him was that he was needed as a material witness. And this is when you can arrest somebody you think is going to run away so that they don't have to testify. He was arrested as a material witness in a terrorism case against a former classmate of his, a guy named Sami Omar al Hussein. But Kidd was never test called to testify in that case. Uh, and in fact, he wasn't even told after the fact that Hussein was acquitted on the most serious terrorism charges. So Kidd sued the government, claiming that he was wrongfully held under the material witness statute as an excuse to hold him in order to investigate and question him about terrorism. His original suit named John Ashcroft, who was the attorney general in 2003, a couple of FBI agents and the wardens at the prisons where he was held because of the conditions of his confinement. Kidd, in the years since, he has reached settlements with the wardens and unfortunately, last year, the Supreme Court ruled that Ashcroft had qualified immunity. He's a, you know, he's a government official. He, you can't touch him. But that still leaves a, a couple of people in, named in the suit. Okay, in June of this year, U.S. Magistrate Michael Williams issued a ruling that stated, I'm quoting, the circumstantial evidence supports the inference that Al-Kid may have been detained for reasons in addition to securing his testimony at trial. That is, the government willfully misused the material witness statute in order to arrest Kidd. What's more, Williams, now Williams, this Magistrate Williams, he was the guy that gave the warrant to the FBI uh, to, to arrest Williams. He said the information that was given to him to justify that warrant was, quoting him again, misleading and highly suggestive of illicit involvement with criminal activity inferring a motive to flee. For example, Williams was told that Kidd had a first-class uh, first class one-way ticket to Saudi Arabia uh, and that he'd received $20,000 from Hussein. In fact, he had an economy-class round-trip ticket and yes, he did get money for Hussein for legitimate work he had done for Hussein's company. What's more, the, there are things FBI did not tell Williams. They did not tell Williams that Kidd was a citizen, that again, he was born and raised here. They did not tell him that his wife and his son and many family members are living in the United States. They did not tell him that he had never failed to cooperate with the FBI, or they also failed to tell him that he was on his way to Saudi Arabia uh, because of a, an academic scholarship, not in order to avoid testifying. In fact, Williams wasn't, uh, I'm sorry, um, Kidd was not even told that his testimony might be required in this case until after he was arrested. Despite all that, despite all of this, the Justice Department, Barack Obama's Justice Department, sought to have his request that his case go to trial be dismissed summarily. Happily, about two weeks ago, 
Federal Judge Edward Lodge in Idaho affirmed the ruling from Magistrate Williams that there was evidence that the government may have willfully misused the material witness case, uh, a law against Kidd, so his case should go to trial. In fact, Lodge went further than Williams did. Lodge said the original affidavit from the FBI to justify the arrest, quote, evidences a reckless disregard for the truth, unquote. Now, Kidd actually describes himself as, he says, um, uh, anti-Bin Laden, anti-Taliban, anti-suicide bombing, anti-terrorism. Uh, but despite that, and despite this hard-won legal victory, um, Kidd has already paid a big price. He's already paid a big price. He, he lost his scholarship to Saudi Arabia. His marriage fell apart under the strain. A, uh, uh, the relationship with a daughter has also fallen apart under the strain. And he was unable to find work in the United States. He had to leave the country to find work. He's now living in Saudi Arabia where he teaches English. All right, that's one story. Here's the other story I wanted to tell you. This is one I've been wanting to talk about a couple of weeks since this suit was first filed. Uh, just over a month ago, it was, the first week in September, the uh, American Arab Anti-Discrimination -Dis Committee, the American Friends Service Committee, which if you don't know the AFSC, they are the social action arm of the Quaker Church in the United States, uh, along with the Center for Constitutional Rights and the People's Law Office, they jointly filed suit in federal court in Chicago challenging the federal government's restriction on their First Amendment rights to engage in what's called coordinated advocacy with one Muhammad A. Salah. Muhammad Salah is a U.S. citizen. He's living in Chicago, and he is the only U.S. citizen living in the United States who is labeled a specially designated terrorist by the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which is part of the Treasury Department. Now, once an individual is labeled a specially designated terrorist, all persons and organizations are prohibited from engaging in coordinated speech with them, even if it's just to protest their designation as a terrorist. Uh, these other groups, for example, couldn't have a press conference with them. They couldn't co-sign a letter with them. They couldn't do a petition with them. In fact, they couldn't even do a letter or a petition on their own if he expressed approval of or gratitude for their efforts. They couldn't do that, this, that is, without running the risk of breaking the law and hypothetically being labeled terrorist organizations themselves. Now that label, specially designated terrorist, can be placed on someone, it can be placed on anyone without any due process or probable cause or evidence of criminal wrongdoing. In fact, when Salah was labeled this way, the notice simply announced the fact. It provided no factual basis, no legal basis for that judgment. This appears to have been based on a, a um, on some alleged connections he had to Hamas sometime in the past at a time when it was not illegal to be connected to Hamas in the United States. It's like, you know, are you now or have you ever been? The government never even told Salah about the notice. They, he and his family didn't even know about this until they ran smack into the brick wall of restrictions it created. In that case, the restriction at their bank account was frozen. These restrictions are extreme. They are so extreme that they, they prevent you from, uh, prevent him from carrying out normal life activities. Salah cannot get a job. He cannot pay his rent. He cannot get medical care. He cannot buy a loaf of bread without getting prior approval from the Treasury Department. And the Treasury Department has unfettered, unlimited uh, discretion to impose whatever restrictions it wants. This has been going on with him for 17 years. Yes, I said 17 years. On January 23rd, 1995, then President Bill Clinton, who's now the, the Democrats' ideal of all things good and true, he signed an executive order uh, declaring a state of national emergency to deal with violent acts by foreign terrorists who were thought to be trying to undermine the Middle East peace process. Notice how well that has actually helped that peace process proceed. Six months later, the summer of 1995, uh, the Treasury Department 
uh, uh, labeled Salah a specially designated terrorist. Nothing in the statutes, nothing in the executive order, nothing in the regulations requires a Treasury Department to at any time review or reconsider his status. It's like once a specially designated terrorist, always a specially designated terrorist. In 2009, the Treasury Department, Barack Obama's Treasury Department, issued a new set of restrictions on KID, one so onerous that it's almost impossible to comply with them. Uh, the new license directed that, for one thing, for even authorized expenses, even for things that the Treasury Department says, yes, you can spend your money on this, the source of the money could not come from a source inside the United States. In other words, what this meant was his friends, his family, his neighbors, and so on could not help him out with expenses. In addition, the license requires him to keep records of everything he buys, down to the penny, every single thing he buys, to prove that every one of these transactions falls within the realm of basic maintenance. What does that mean? It means he cannot buy a book. He cannot buy a newspaper. He can't go to a movie. He can't go to a concert. He can't go to a sporting event. He can't do any of the normal things that we regard as part of normal life. He can't donate to a political campaign. He can't volunteer for a political candidate without the Treasury Department's prior approval. What's more, his religion, require, he is a Muslim, his religion, his religion requires him to make regular donations to charity, which he can't do. It also requires him to at some point make the pilgrimage to Mecca, which he also can't do. If this was the old Soviet Union, we'd say he'd been made a non-person. But here's the kicker, here's the real kicker of this. In December 2011, a unanimous panel of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that many of these restrictions with regard to political campaigns and coordinated advocacy are clearly unconstitutional, that they violate the First Amendment rights both of KID, uh, of Salah rather, and of these other organizations. But nearly a year later, the Treasury Department has not amended its regulations to conform to that ruling. They have simply ignored it. The Treasury Department, in fact, is not alone in ignoring court rulings that affect the anti-terrorism regime. In July 2011, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals found that the TSA should have instituted a period of public rulemaking, that is public comment, on the proposal to use those those full body scanners as a primary means of, of, of um, screening method at, at airports. The court ordered the agency to begin that process promptly. More than a year later, the TSA has done nothing to that end. They have simply ignored it. Now, the Electronic Privacy Information Center has gone back to that court to request an order requiring the agency to begin this process within 60 days or give up the use of the scanners entirely. In response, the TSA has claimed that the earliest it could possibly finalize documents to even begin the public comment period is the end of February 2013, more than 18 months after the agency was ordered to do so promptly. And during this time, the same 18 months, by the way, an unknown amount of goods and money has been stolen from passengers passing through the TSA checkpoints at airports by those TSA checkers. In fact, it turns out the TSA agents have been stealing from airline passengers' belongings on a fairly regular basis. Nearly 400 TSA employees have been fired for stealing since the agency was created. One of these people, his name was Pythias Brown, uh, he served three years in prison for theft, and he said that he stole something around $800,000 in cash and personal belongings from travelers before he was caught. He's called the stealing, quoting him, very commonplace, very convenient, and massive. Now, as a quick sidebar to this, Senator Chuck Schumer has called on the TSA to uh, do random sting operations on its employees and propose that the TSA randomly screen its employees at the end of each work shift. It'll be interesting to see how the TSA agents feel about being the targets of random searches rather than the targeters. But 
after all, I'm sure they actually won't mind. Really, I'm sure they won't mind. It is, after all, part of the overall plan to protect us from the, ooh, scary terrorists. Be very afraid. I mean, as, as an example of this, this protection, consider these so-called fusion centers. These are the, the places where well, their job is to coordinate terrorism-related information among federal, state, and local agencies. Hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars have been spent on these uh, uh, fusion centers over the last nine years. On October 3rd, the Senate's Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations released results of a study that found the intelligence, if I can call it that, so produced, the intelligence provided to the feds by this program was, quoting the report, oftentimes shoddy, rarely timely, sometimes endangering citizens' civil liberties and Privacy Act protections, occasionally taken from already published public sources, and more often than not, unrelated to terrorism, unquote. But don't worry. Don't worry, they are out there looking after us. They really are. Just ask Michael Galindo of Houston, Texas. In mid-September, he was taking photographs of a cloud formation as part of a volunteer program for the National Weather Service. In fact, this is, this is the picture. This is the picture that he took. Now, unfortunately for him, those buildings visible a couple of hundred yards away, that's a refinery. Someone from the refinery spotted him. They called the police who called the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force with the result that on October 5th, the FBI showed up at Galindo's door and questioned him for 20 minutes. Now, here's the thing. This is why this is a good wrap-up for this whole thing. The FBI agent was satisfied with Galindo's explanation, but after questioning him for 20 minutes, left him with the bit of advice, according to Galindo, of just be careful next time. Just be careful. He had every right to do what he was doing. He had every legal right, every constitutional right, every logical right to do exactly what he did. But be careful. Oh, no, don't do what you have the right to do. Don't do what you're free to do. Don't do what you can, what's justified for you to do. Oh, no, don't. Be careful. Don't stand out. Don't do what you have a right to do. Blend in. Be unobtrusive. Be completely inoffensive. Because if you don't do that, remember, we're watching you for your own good, of course. We're going to take a break. And we're back. And we're going to start right now with our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. This week, it involves one David Siegel. He's the founder and CEO of the giant timeshare company called Westgate Resorts. He recently sent an email to all of his employees, and he started out in the first paragraph by saying, quoting, of course, as your employer, I can't tell you who to vote for, and I certainly wouldn't interfere with your right to vote for whomever you chose. In fact, I encourage you to vote for whomever you think uh, will serve your interests the best. However, he said, let me share a few facts that might help you decide what is in your best interest. He then goes on after a lot of ranting and raving and denunciations of this, that, and the other thing. It comes down to the important fact being that, quoting the letter, if any new taxes are levied on me or my company as our current president plans, I will have no choice but to reduce the size of this company. In other words, if you vote for Obama, it could cost you your job. And he ends up by threatening that if Obama wins, he might simply shut down the company entirely, throw everyone out of work, and uh, retire to the Bahamas. I mean, this kind of transparent manipulation, this obvious bullying, uh, these obvious threats, these obvious attempts, this is not unprecedented, okay? There are companies that do this. They're rarely this blatant about it. But a lot of companies have done this kind of thing to basically tell their employees, um, sure, you can vote however you want, but if you don't vote the way I want, you're fired. This kind of thing is hardly unknown. It's hardly unprecedented. It doesn't change the fact that it is a moral outrage. All right, from there, we're actually going to zip right on to our other weekly feature, the, uh, the Clarabelle Award. 
Now, actually, I have to tell you right off that actually this is going to go under a name change. Clarabelle was a very noble clown uh, out of the Howdy Doody show. And if you don't remember the Howdy Doody show, it's your loss. The um, thing is, Clarabelle was a noble clown, and I've decided that I don't want Clarabelle to have to be associated with uh, all of the jackasses that actually get this award. So here is our new logo for the award, which from now on will be called the Clown Award. And it is, however, still given for acts of meritorious stupidity. The winner this week, David Weigel, the founder and CEO, or Siegel rather, the founder and CEO of the giant timeshare company Westgate Resorts for the same email. Why? Why did he get the e clown award for this? Because a good part of this twerpy rant he sent to his employees consists of a long self-pitying whine about how tough he has it, how hard it is for him, what a tough life he's had getting incredibly rich, what how rough it is, what a burden it is to have at least hundreds of millions of dollars, how being rich is just so hard. It's so hard to be filthy rich. What a burden it is is on him to be such an obviously superior human being who, to quote him, made all the right decisions. He goes on about the steep price he has paid by being incredibly rich and the wounds he has suffered by becoming incredibly rich. And he mules and sniffles and moans about his tough life and how hard he has it amidst all this morass of self-pity, even as he is engaged currently in building a 90,000 square foot house. What a clown. All right, from there... Uh, I'm going to have a bit more uh, on some on voter ID, on voter ID. A bit of news about this. First uh, news: we found voter fraud. We did. Uh, unfortunately for the right wingers, it was committed by right wingers. It was actually committed by an outfit uh, called Strategic Allied Consultants of Glen Allen, Virginia. This is an outfit that the Republican National Committee had hired uh, to do voter registration in five states and paid the company $1.3 million to do it. Well, it turns out that the company was found to be turning in more than 100 questionable registration applications to the election board of Palm Beach County, Florida. And this quickly turned out there are a lot of questionable ballots, uh, questionable uh, registrations, a lot of other places as well. It also developed that the guy in charge of strategic allied consultants is one Nathan Sproul. He's a longtime Republican Party operative who is also has a long history of, let's be polite and call it questionable activities uh, regarding voter registration. For example, back in 2004, the company, then called Sproul & Associates, was found to be lying about a ballot initiative in Arizona at a time when, by the way, Sproul was the state director of the GOP in Arizona. It was lying about this ballot initiative that would have eviscerated the state's clean elections law. Two years later, the company was investigated for charges of destroying registration forms of people who registered as Democrats so that those people would show up at the polls thinking they had registered only to discover that they hadn't. In 2008, the name was changed to Lincoln Associates and it worked for the McCain campaign. Then a few months ago, it became Strategic Allied Consultants. Apparently, changing the name at the urging of the Republican National Committee, which wanted to hire Sproul to do his voter registration hoo-ha stuff without anybody actually realizing who it was. Now Sproul has been caught. The company has been fired by the RNC. Now, truth be told, this kind of voter fraud, this uh, registration fraud, is not uncommon in the United States. It generally happens because the canvassing companies hire people to gather signatures, and those people are too often paid based on the number of signatures they get, which creates an obvious incentive to uh, create phony registrations. This is what happened with ACORN, if you remember that group. What you might not remember is that what got ACORN in trouble 
uh, was that officials knew that ACORN was turning in phony registration forms. They knew that because ACORN, which obeyed the law, which required them to turn in all forms regardless, flagged the ones that they thought were phony and said, you need to check these. That's how they knew. That was the fraud that made ACORN the right wing's cause celebre for a time until they successfully bankrupted it. It'll be easy, interesting to see now how many right wingers will be out for the blood of strategic allied consultants of Glen Allen, Virginia. The thing is though, fraud like this, this registration fraud really doesn't affect elections. Non-existent people living at phony addresses are not gonna show up to vote. The bigger victims of this fraud are actually the companies that hire them that then got ripped off. In-person voter fraud, the kind that's to be uh, affected by these photo ID laws is actually extremely rare. Uh, and far more, far more people will be wrongfully and needlessly, but in the right wing's world, deliberately excluded from voting. Now, there has been some successful pushback in a number of states against these laws. But if we're going to engage in more than a rear guard action, more than a slow the advance of the enemy action, what we have to do is keep pressing the question, keep asking, keep pushing on the question of why the right wing regards voting with such fear that they regard it as something to be suppressed rather than encouraged. All right, I got about two minutes left, I'm told. So I'm going to fill it with this. I don't normally talk about election campaigns. I don't, but I have to say something about the, the uh, senatorial campaign in Massachusetts between uh, Elizabeth Warren and our own Scat Brown. This was a relatively reasonable campaign early on. They agreed no outside PAC money, which doesn't really affect those PACs from doing it anyway, but they agreed. And most of the campaign had been what we would like to see in a campaign. A lot of it had been about why you should vote for me uh, and criticizing the other person's record and votes, but not anything personal. That continued until Elizabeth Warren caught up with Scat Brown, until she started to pass Scat Brown in some of those polls. At that point, suddenly, his campaign turned really nasty and really personal really fast. Lies, innuendo, smears have been everything that he has done since. Look at her. You can tell she's not Native American. What is this, 1952? We're going to go around and tell what people's heritage is by the way they look? Maybe we should take him into Boston and he can pick out all the Jews based on how they look. Scat Brown has proven more about himself in this campaign than he has about Elizabeth Warren. I'm out of here. We'll see you next week. Okay? You have a great week.